Hi, my name is Chris Pupke from the Biophilia Foundation, and I'm out here today with Ned Gerber, who is the wildlife habitat ecologist and director of Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage. Thank you, Ned, for being out here. That's uh, good. What is the mission of Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage? Yeah, our mission is to design, build, and then manage wildlife habitat primarily on private land in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And what does uh, Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage do when you're talking about habitat restoration and management? Well, we meet with the landowner, see what they have, whether it's a backyard or a farm or something in between, and we give them a menu of things they can do to help the wildlife resource and let landowners pick from the menu. And then once the landowner has hopefully picked a number of items from the menu, we go ahead and install them, be they plantings or bird houses or what have you. And then we are there over the long haul um, to maintain those habitats. Tell me about Barnstable Hill Farm where we are today for this interview. Well, Barnstable Hill Farm was a, is a farm that uh, the White family um, had for many, many years. And it was the first conservation easement uh, Maryland Environmental Trust Conservation has been given in Queen Anne's County, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I actually, when I got out of school, was a tenant on this farm and became friendly with the owner, Mrs. John Campbell White. And over the years, we, uh, she allowed us to restore some wetlands here, one of which is behind us. And eventually, when she passed away, um, the family decided to give the farm to Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage. And we have done all sorts of sustainable agriculture. You know, we don't use anything but herbicides, no treated seeds, any of those sorts of things. Um, a lot of wetlands, a lot of meadows, that sort of deal. Um, but anyway, so we've uh, taken the farm and, and run with it in terms of uh, restoring the maximum amount of wildlife habitat that we can, as well as doing some sustainable agriculture. So you do a lot of you do a lot of wildlife habitat restoration here. Right, we've done a lot, and now it's more a matter more a matter of just uh, maintaining uh, what we have in terms of controlling invasive plants, um, replanting wildflowers in the meadows. Grasses over time dominate meadows, and so to. Uh, have them be you know, maximally effective for pollinators, we go back in and replant wildflowers. We do some replantings every year here. And tell me about the view that's behind us. Well, this, is a, this used to be a soybean field. So this was a farm field. This was a farm field 20, 22 years ago. And um, we proposed to put it in the Conservation Reserve Program. And the federal representative in this county told us that it was not eligible. He was very wrong, but there are a lot of problems in the United States Department of Agriculture, even to this day with Farm Bill programs. So anyway, this individual was wrong. We didn't know about the appeal process, so the Fish and Wildlife Service and our own funding was used to restore this wetland in what was a soybean field. It's a pretty wet field uh, back then. And um, over the years, we planted some button bush in here and a few other plants, but mostly it's just natural succession. And maybe 10 years ago, uh, beavers moved into the wetland, uh, which are great fun. They keep a lot of trees cut down for us, so we don't have to cut them or spray them ourselves. And um, so we, you know, manage this um, within cooperation with the beavers. Um, we do fun things like let the beavers basically do whatever they want, but we do put electric fence around some of the adjacent cornfields, um, which the beavers usually tunnel under, which is fine for us, but it keeps the deer out. So we're very, you know, pro uh, living with the beavers and um, they, they have a happy home here. Typically, do you work on your own property or are you working with other folks, private individuals? When we first started doing this, when CWH was first formed, there was no CRP, um, Conservation Reserve Program. And so what we would do then is try to find landowners that had a strong interest in waterfowl, and we got a little bit of money from the Eastern Waterfowl Festival, and we would use that money to restore wetlands back then. Then the Conservation Reserve Program came along, and I got convinced Mrs. White, who was still alive at that time, to, we did some buffer strips on this farm, and I think we got $37 an acre for the buffer strips, and we thought we were really doing something. We helped the quail and the rabbits and the pollinators, and so we put a bunch of $37 an acre buffer strips in. Of course, now you get $400 an acre in a buffer strip, but what really uh, helped us was when Al Gore flew into Conquest Farm, and um, we had a you know, big meeting there of all the people in the state, and he announced this Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, and um, that raised the rates 
per uh, acre for the landowner. So not only were the landowners getting free buffer strip installation and free wetlands, they were also getting, at that time, around $200 an acre instead of the about $100 an acre they were getting up to that time. All of a sudden, conservationists came out of the woodwork because their farmers were paying them 60 or 70. Uncle Sam would pay them 200 for ditch buffers and wetlands. And uh, we got, the goal was to get 100,000 acres in CREP. We got up to 70, 75,000 acres. And then uh, Governor Ehrlich came in and shut the program down. And that pretty much killed the program. Ever since then, the acreage has been going downwards. I think now it's maybe 45 or 50,000. And um, that, that really you know, put a dagger in the heart of the program. Why restore these habitats? Why put in these buffers? Why restore wetlands? Um, it's the only chance wildlife have. Um, if you look at the Chester River, Chop Tank River, Watershed, even today they're about 70% farmland. Um, and if we had gotten to 100,000 acres of CREP in the whole state, that would have been 4% of the tillable land enrolled in the program. So we never even got to 4%. The watersheds are being 70% tilled. Wildlife are you know, basically running out of habitat, especially the type of habitats we're talking about. Um, we do have a significant acreage of wooded wetlands in the state, especially on the Delmarva Peninsula, and we have a pretty significant acreage of tidal wetlands on the peninsula. What we don't have is freshwater non-tidal wetlands. They're in short supply. Historically, they would have been uh, supplied by beaver flowages, but when uh, farmers took over the Delmar Peninsula, they solved the beaver problem by killing them all. And to this day, 99% um, of people on the peninsula will kill beavers on site, which is really unfortunate. But in any event, um, so this program put back grassy meadows, which there were none of, especially since cow farming went out in the 60s, and freshwater wetlands, which there were none of since beavers were wiped out you know, in the 1700s and 1800s. And what are the challenges that wildlife face today around the Chesapeake Bay region? They are many. I probably have to take my shoes and socks off to count them all. I don't think we want that. But anyway, they range from things like uh, habitat loss. You know, there are still wood wetlands being converted to agriculture, um, and they're still being converted to housing developments and things of that nature. Um, sea level rise is, uh, you know, turning tidal wetlands into open water. Um, it's things that are much more insidious, like treated crop seeds. Most corn and soybean seeds now, unfortunately, are treated with fungicides and a type of insecticide called neonicotinoids. We call them neonics for short. And the neonics have all sorts of lethal and sublethal impacts on uh, native insects, uh, particularly native bees and bumblebees are one we're very concerned about. Um, but they have, you know, uh, impacts on other uh, beneficial insects as well. Um, fungicides also are uh, an unknown problem. Uh, it's not been you know, greatly uh, studied yet, but we know that the fungicides that seeds are treated with or are sprayed over the fields, typically wheat is often sprayed in the spring on Delmarva uh, with fungicides. Um, that causes problems for native pollinators as well. So there are many threats from you know, the really obscure ones like insecticides that are, you know, if you're not out there the day spraying, you would never know what even happened to you know, actual habitat loss. And what is, uh, the Chesapeake Bay has been the focus of a lot of efforts at restoration and water quality improvement. What is the biggest polluter of the Chesapeake Bay? Agriculture by far is the, the biggest polluter of the bay and, and these crep buffer strips and wetlands um, are documented um, to ameliorate those effects. We have a study we did with Smithsonian on this farm that showed that depending on how much flow there is, um, the, you know, the wetland take 50-60% of the nutrients out of the uh, flow off the farmland during periods of low to mid flow. When you get really high flows, there's really not a technology available to, to do that, but at least during mid to low flows, we have a good technology. Mm -hmm. um, what types of habitat does Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage restore? Uh, pretty much, uh, if you can think of it, we'll restore it from you know, uh, uh, freshwater wetlands through meadows, grassy buffer strips, wooded buffer strips. The only thing we really haven't gotten into is living shoreline because there are a lot of people, A, doing that. There aren't any government programs that really support it. So it's expensive for the landowner and it's still sort of a, a wilderness in terms of um, what benefits are we really getting. It's, it's very cost ineffective in terms of uh, wildlife habitat or nutrient uh, retention relative to things we can do on the farm.
When you restore a meadow, what type of plants are you looking at? Uh, we're plants? looking at, typically we look at um, doing native warm season grasses, little blue stem, broom sedge, side oats, grandma, and maybe some cool season grasses like Canada wild rye or Virginia wild rye. And another uh, warm season grass, uh, eastern uh, gamma grass is another one that we need to come. Uh, what type of wildlife benefits? It's a full range of wildlife, from migratory birds, be they, you know, uh, grasshopper sparrows nesting here during the year, during the summer, um, wintering sparrows. Uh, we have seven or eight species that commonly use the meadows that we build, and then you know, migratory waterfowl are really the hook that a lot of landowners are interested in. So, you know, we might build them a wetland because they're really interested in wild waterfowl, but we're as or more interested in the, you know, the painted turtles and the shorebirds and the other uh, you know, creatures that are going to use that wetland. And the same with buffer strips, uh, they might be you know, interested in uh, quail, for example. Our interest, while we're interested in quail, we think unfortunately they are pretty much extinct on the Del Marva now. Um, so we're really interested in the pollinators aspect of that, as well as the, the, the wintering. And what type of water quality benefits? Are there any water quality benefits to this work? Yeah, the fantastic water quality benefits. So, very well documented uh, in the literature what buffer strips and created, you know, constructed wetlands can do the water quality. Mm -hmm. um, and the important thing we think is some groups are now, you know, building what we call habitat-less water quality projects, um, where their, you know, their their goal is to tell the farmer, look, we're not going to take any land out of production, but we can improve water quality by doing some uh, things in the ditch. We're opposed to that. We think that we need to be doing both. We need to be improving water quality and improving wildlife habitat at the same time. And warm season grasses, what are their benefits for wildlife and water quality for the Chesapeake Bay? So warm season grasses, uh, have a very, they're very deep rooted and um, what we like about them is they're clumpy. So whereas lawn fescues that people are familiar with, for example on a golf course in your backyard, there's just a carpet of grass and you know every you know, you can't, you can't put your finger down in an area like that without touching a blade of grass. In a warm season grass meadow, there are clumps of warm season grass, and in between those clumps are bare ground or wildflowers. And you know, we like the warm season grasses, but we like what's in between them, which is nothing or some pollinator habitat, uh, just as well. Uh, so that the, so little birds and, and things like that can move in between these clumps with you know overhead protection. Um, which they can't do in a fescue meadow or something of that nature, orchard grass meadow. For and you mentioned earlier about a study that you did with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center right. and your wetlands. Can you tell me right. a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we're right there. There's one of the old boxes over there in the distance. Um, so what was done is the watershed size was calculated and we knew exactly how much water was coming in during a storm event and, a ma and what its quality was and we knew exactly how much was leaving and what its quality was. And so the comparison was made, and it was found that the, the wetlands were very beneficial to water quality, as I think I said earlier. You know, 30 to 60 percent of the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus could be removed by a constructed wetland. So that wetland is having beneficial impact on water quality and wildlife. Right, exactly. Yep. Um, and the landowner's pocketbook. I mean, we tell people the only reason not to do this is if you don't like water quality, wildlife, or money, because all three benefit from this. And are there any wildlife species that you consider a keystone species in your work? Uh, beavers. Any yeah, beavers would certainly be a keystone species because they can actually manipulate the environment. They actually save us money and labor by keeping the, there's nothing wrong with wooded wetlands, but we are trying to establish what we call hemi marshes on a lot of these, where there's a mixture of cattails and other emergent plants, some shrubs like the button bush in the background here. Um, we don't want to become a sweet gum swamp, and so the beavers do a lot of free work for us there. Um, the, another keystone species um, from what I would call a keystone species is a species like the monarch butterfly or migratory waterfowl because they attract a lot of attention from humans. People love both of those species. And so in their own way, I consider them to be sort of keystone because without wild waterfowl, for example, we would be sitting here having this conversation right now because most of the concern um, for wetlands is from people that are interested in waterfowl, quite frankly. And, and finally, uh, this morning, what impact has Biophilia Foundation's support had on Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage's work well, to restore, manage, and protect wildlife? It's been nothing but fantastically positive. I mean, the funding from Biophilia enables us to do what we do. You know, without them, we, I don't think we could stay in business because when we, the government, 
limits how much money we can charge for habitat installation through CREP, which is most of our work. So for example, we are allowed to charge $500 an acre for a buffer strip. Well, it costs us probably, in terms of seed, time, labor, and all that, it probably costs us you know, $450 an acre to do the buffer strip. So people call us and say, well, I've got two acres. Well, we actually lose money when we do that because by the time we move the equipment in and out of there, we've lost money. So Biophilia enables us to service you know, habitat restoration, whether it's one where we can break even or even lose a little bit of money. Um, same with wetland restoration. We don't, you know, we, they typically cost five, six thousand dollars an acre. We're actually, by law, we're prohibited from, in the budgets, which you know, you've seen them, I can show you, we're, there's not a line item for CWH time and design and labor. Um, Biophilia covers some of that time and labor that takes me to design the wetland and to work with the excavators to build it and all that. So it's essential. So there you have it. Thank you, Ned, for your time. You're welcome. And remember, Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage can create this out of a farm field, benefiting a whole host of wildlife, from waterfowl down to frogs, even dragonflies. And your support of Biophilia Foundation and Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage can make that happen. Thank you.